Hey, welcome back to the vault. I know it's been a while, but I'm glad you're here because we're gonna take a look at some cool shit together. We're gonna look at a computer that helped bring forth many technologies to the market and help them go mainstream. And this computer helps set the bar even higher. Enter the 1999 Power Macintosh G3 Blue and White. It was November 1997 when Apple introduced the Power Magatosh G3 desktop and mini tower. But in 1999, January of 1999, Steve Jobs came along and by this time he was already introducing this new product strategy at Apple. And the first computer in that new product strategy was the iMac. It had a completely new design and a new focus on the internet, a lot of great things. But Apple needed some pro products, right? So essentially they took a lot of the design language of the iMac and put it into a tower form factor aimed at pros. And this computer sold at an entry level price of $15.99, but there were a bunch of different configurations you could get and a server model, which I think was about five grand. So the computer had a new design, but on the inside, there was a lot more. There was so much horsepower packed into this thing and a lot of new features that mainstream computers did not have. Arguably, this computer brought forth a lot of new technologies to the market. A big one was Firewire. We may not even think about that now because when was the last time you bought a computer and it had Firewire on it? But think about Thunderbolt. Think about what Thunderbolt does. Firewire was like the Thunderbolt of the late 90s and early 2000s. And this was the first computer sold with Firewire built in. It wasn't a card, it wasn't an external device, it was built in. And we'll talk more about that later. Just by looking at it, you can tell it's different than a lot of the beige boxes that were available at the time. But Steve Jobs talked about how design is not just how something looks, it's, it's how it works too. So like, you had these cool handles on top too. They looked nice, but they also had a practical use. You can carry the computer easily. On the front, there was this simple little lever. You could pull it and take the door down and get access to the internal components, even if the computer was running. It was a toolless, easy open design to get to your components inside the Mac. The actual logic board or the motherboard, whatever that you want to call it, is actually contained on the side panel itself. It's not actually in here with the things like the power supply and the CD drive. So. This actually makes it extremely easy to work on and service because you're not having to flip this whole thing over like you do on, you know, a regular computer. And that's something you don't see at all with any Apple product nowadays. These old Power Mac towers, the G3s, the G4s, and the G5s, my favorite machines of all time, they represent an Apple that we no longer have. When Apple released these machines, they were pro, pro, pro. They were always thinking of the pro and they were tuning the machines internally and releasing revisions of the machines constantly. And I know that I said this in my iBook G3 segment on Vintage Apple Vault, but this is just so unlike Apple today at how easy that they make it to get inside of this computer and really customize it and expand it. A big selling point for this computer was the PowerPC processor. It was a 400 megahertz G3. I mean, yes, you can tell the G3 was a big selling point of the computer. It's in the name. It scored a 13.1 on the bite mark benchmark which was double of what a typical 450 megahertz Pentium 2 would score. So this thing, it just screamed. This was also the first Mac, in fact, the first personal computer on the market to sell with an ATI Rage 128 graphics accelerator. And that came with 16 megabytes of video memory. This thing just slaughtered the graphics performance of the previous G3. Now here's the advantage Apple has. They control the hardware and the software. So as they were introducing this new hardware, they also planned and announced that they were licensing OpenGL from Silicon Graphics and they were gonna implement it into the Mac OS. And it's stuck inside the Mac OS for a long time. Now let's geek out about the black and white tech specs, right? So this thing could be configured with up to one gigabyte of RAM and that was just the configuration from Apple. I'm sure someone figured out how to put more in there. You could configure this computer with three internal disks and Apple sold 36 gigabyte IBM hard disks, so just over 100 gigabytes of storage space you could have, and those were all Ultra ATA based. In terms of optical drives, you could have CD-ROM, DVD-ROM, this one's a DVD-RAM, you could even have a zip drive installed as well, so plenty of options there. And on the inside, plenty of expansion, you had four 64-bit PCI slots, Three of them were at 33 megahertz and one was clocked at 66 megahertz. And another key selling point to the G3 was all of the plug and play IO on the back. 
And debatably, one of the best features of the I.O. was USB. Like with the first iMac, Apple really pushed USB with this computer because at the time, especially when the iMac first came out, there were very few computers available with USB. So USB was hot pluggable, as opposed to the Mac serial port, which was not. And it also had 30 times the bitrate, so big jump. While we're on the topic of I.O., let's take a look at the other ports. Ethernet, Apple Desktop Bus, Firewire 400, VGA, Audio In, Audio Out, and again, USB, which ran at 12 megabits per second. So again, USB was about 30 times faster than the Mac serial port, but Firewire was about 30 times faster than USB. And it was built in. Firewire was a technology that was under development for quite some time, and you could use it with earlier Macs, but you would typically have to get external components or cards, etc, etc. This was the first Mac, and again, probably the first computer, I'm open to debate that, that had Firewire 400 built in. Firewire ran at 400 megabits per second, which was just blazingly fast at the time. Five times faster than SCSI, and it was hot pluggable. You didn't have to worry about terminators, you didn't have to worry about breaking stuff. You could hot plug it, no problem, super fast data transfer speed. And it worked with a crap ton of devices. Now that bitrate didn't just make data trans faster, but it opened up new possibilities. Think about what we do with video nowadays. It's just so seamless, but back then, capturing video in real time was a big challenge if you didn't have the bandwidth. Firewire 400 opened up the possibility to capture video off a camera in real time without dropping any quality. Before this tiny little port was built into this Mac, someone would have to spend money on capture equipment and hook it all up and capture video into their computer. And it was just very expensive and just kind of cumbersome. This port bypassed all of that. And this is where Final Cut Pro steps in, Apple's new professional video editing software. That software was made possible because of the performance and because of Firewire built into this computer. So it was frequently marketed with this machine and that changed the way we look at digital video for a long time. In fact, Final Cut Pro still exists today. And some other great things about the Firewire technology, it could also power disks. So if you wanted to plug in a disk for data transfer and power all over one cable, so you didn't have to plug into an AC outlet, you could do that with Firewire. And if you had a SCSI device, you could still get SCSI cards from Apple, plug them into the machine, and you would have full backward compatibility. I wanna revisit digital video for a second. Because nowadays you can take out your phone, boom, click, shoot a movie, and you're done. But let's not take that for granted. Let's think about how that technology became possible. And yes, there were a lot of team players to make this happen. But since we're on the topic of Apple, let's talk about them and a guy named Randy Ubilos. On my far left is the guy who started the whole digital revolution. And let's face it, he is the guy who started it. And uh, when he one day goes to the pearly gates, he can say, I invented Final Cut Pro, and they'll let him write in. <laughs> now Randy was the chief architect of Final Cut Pro, but he also was the lead on Adobe Premiere. And he also worked on hardware-based solutions for video capture, such as the Super Mac digital film card. You take the job with uh, uh, Super Mac. Yep. 1990, I got it in my notes, and I could be wrong here. You, um, they wanted you to write this software for this card, this Nubis card. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Called, um, digital uh, film. called digital film, which is, watch this, folks, see if it works. Well, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the digital that film. That thing. That thing. And it was $5,000, though, right? Yep. They wanted some software, you know, it was, oh, we're going to have digital video sitting on the computer. Now, what are you going to do with it? So I started, like, kind of specking out what, you know, it would look like if you had a couple of tracks and a transition in between. And Captain Crunch was the name of this. So, Crunch. And then Scrunch was software for Crunch. So Scrunch was the code name. It became Real Time was the kind of name for it. Uh, real Time took about 11 months. 11 so Premiere 1.0 was and about it became, 11 months. And it became it real software. It was relabeled software. as It became a real product. Yep. Why is it guys like you can do that kind of stuff and I can't even use Keynote? <laughs> <laughs> and that eventually evolved into Adobe Premiere. In, in between, so the digital film card actually slipped and was getting later and later. And they had come up, figured out that they could do with some of the hardware they were working at, they came up with the video spigot card, which was a much less expensive card. This card could do 640 by 480, uh, 30 frames a second. So basically one field, 30 frames a second, which was huge at the time. The video spigot card could do 160 by 120 at 30 frames a second. 
Which was still at the time but, like, wow, but, look but, what I can do. Look still, how smooth that it is. It sold like 50,000. Sold huge, huge numbers it, of them. Yeah, because it was $500. Yeah. And then he started working for Adobe and continued developing Adobe Premiere until version 5. Why'd you go to Adobe? Because I mean, they allowed you to work more. Because on... they were going to carry the for product forward and they were going to put a bunch of money behind it and they were going to put. And Super Mac was not going to do that. Correct. Okay. Correct. Super Mac was selling it off. Then, Randy and his group were hired by Macromedia to work on a program called Key Grip, which was a video editing program based on Apple's QuickTime technology. Key Grip is what eventually became Final Cut Pro. Macromedia brought you over and it was a code name Key Grip. Went to uh, Las Vegas and demoed it. Yep. And the, the response was... The response was good. It was actually an interesting, because at that NAB, Steve Jobs actually gave the keynote. Steve's presentation was basically to all the broadcasters, <laughs> you guys need to shape. move forward because yeah, the exactly. computer industry is gonna come and eat your lunch. <laughs> but then backstage, that was the first point. I talked to him and he was asking me, um, you know, where did I live in relation to Cupertino and what would I think about you know, coming to, <laughs> <laughs> having the project come to Apple, because that was April. Long story short, there were some intellectual property issues and Macromedia was trying to sell Key Grip, which they eventually named Final Cut Pro. And this is where Apple stepped in because Macromedia wanted to sell more of their non-web-based applications so they could focus on web applications. So we were, the next month in May, we were actually at the, you know, we all went down to the boardroom at Apple and the uh, CEO of Macromedia told us, so unfortunately, as of tomorrow, none of you have jobs at Macromedia. And then Steve stood up and said, however, you have jobs at Apple tomorrow. Apple bought Final Cut Pro and the team integrated the Firewire support, and created Final Cut Pro, their version, the real good Firewire integrated version. Old version of Final Cut, and if you check out this folder, this is my 500 gigabyte RAID, which is my scratch disk. 500 gigs, a lot of storage for DV editing. I've edited DV on this machine, and it is super smooth. It performs so well under Final Cut. And they demoed it off at NAB 1999. And the timing couldn't have been better. Here's the fun thing. Avid has Media Composer. It is a digital video editor. At the same NAB, when Apple introduced Final Cut Pro for the first time, Avid announced they were dropping support for the Mac. <laughs> just, the timing was perfect. That was like, just a great moment to shovel customers over to Apple. It's Apple's a huge booth gift. <laughs> and looked at this, and it was a very, very busy booth for the entire NAB show. I'm just looking at that laptop there. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you see, uh, where, where do you, look at that. <laughs> and this G3 was used as the demo machine for Final Cut Pro because it had the horsepower and it had the features. It was frequently marketed as a bundle. Again, that hardware software solution. And he knew that there was going to be this port on the front. That was that firewire. And there weren't that many developers for Apple because Apple was going to be out of business as everyone saw it. And so Steve understood that it had to get developed internally and that software was going to be what drove the hardware. And this helped spearhead getting digital video into the hands of many. Heck, I still use Final Cut Pro, even 19 years later. I'm still using it today, a lot of people are, and digital video has exploded. I think it's gonna dramatically increase the number of people who will be, have access to creating great digital video. That was it, yep. that, that changed everything. If that technology didn't advance and Final Cut Pro didn't push the market in this direction, I may not even be talking to you right now. Where would video websites like Vimeo or YouTube even be nowadays if digital video wasn't pushed so hard in the late 90s? It's something to think about, but that might be for a later time. Because right now I have other Mac collectors that want to show you some cool stuff. Let's have a look. What is up everyone? My name is Tom, and for the last decade or so, I have been running the YouTube channel It's My Natural Color. I have a very, very large focus and a huge interest in older Apple equipment, especially PowerPC Macs. And today, Ken, thank you so much for inviting me on the channel. Today, Ken has invited me to talk about one of my greatest projects, one of the coolest things that I've ever done on the channel, and that is my world's fastest G3. Here it is, the Power Mac G3 Blue and White from 1999. This beauty is almost 20 years old, which is hard to believe. I've owned this particular machine 
for around eight or nine years and the original reason for purchase was so stupid. It was listed on eBay with an ADB keyboard and mouse and at the time I was desperate for an ADB keyboard and mouse because I was selling a Macintosh SE and I didn't have a spare keyboard and mouse to sell with it. Now the G3 Blue and White, this guy right here, was the last Mac to ship with an ADB port and it just so happened that the keyboard and mouse that I needed was included in the listing. So it was almost an accidental purchase and I thought that about a week later, maximum, I'd be relisting this G3 on eBay, but oh man, I am so glad I didn't. As soon as it arrived, I fell in love with it. And over the years on my channel, I did various upgrades and I made various videos about the machine showcasing what it could do. Along with my gorgeous G3, I have two original 15 inch Apple Studio displays. And of course, I've got the original keyboard and the dreaded hockey puck mouse just to complete the setup. Cracking open my G3 will reveal an interior that looks pretty different to a factory default G3, but at its core, this machine is still exactly the same thing. All I've done is taken every user replaceable component and cranked it to the max. I've put in the fastest thing that I can find compatible with the machine in almost every area. We have one gigabyte of RAM. That is the maximum amount of RAM that this machine will take. Next up, the ATI Radeon 9200 with 128 megs of VRAM. Alongside, we have the USB 2.0 card, pretty boring, but fairly essential for a machine that predates USB 2.0 by quite a few years. Next to that, we have got the SATA card. This is a bootable SATA card, one of very few models that are in these Power Macs. Next up, we have the IDE card. This guy does a few things. Firstly, the G3, along with other older Macs, has a 128 gigabyte drive limit. You cannot put a drive larger than that capacity in the machine, otherwise it will not recognize it. These are 250 gigs a piece, 500 gigs total, and this guy is a RAID card. So I've chosen to use RAID 0, <laughs> very unreliable, but speedy. RAID 0 to give me 500 gigs of super speedy IDE storage but to use with the SATA card, we have got two Kingston 60 gig SSDs. It is super buttery smooth, but there is one more thing that we have to touch on, and that is, you can just about see him poking out under there. That red PCB is, of course, the CPU upgrade. I have upgraded the extremely rare PowerLogix PowerForce Ziff 1.0 G3 upgrade card. This gives me a one gigahertz G3 chip and man, I am so happy that I own it. It took me years to find one, years and years. I finally got one and it's a beast. You can put a G4 in this system, but I wanted to keep true to the machine itself and stick with the G3 CPU. So for a complete G3 top to bottom system, this is the fastest you can really do. There's not much else you could do. So why do I need such a well-kitted out G3? Well, just like a lot of this older Mac collecting nonsense, there's no logical reason, but coming out the other side of a super cool project, I've ended up with a G3 that is blazing fast. And one thing that that allows me to do is run one of my favorite Mac operating systems of all time, Buttery Smooth. Now the G3, in its factory configuration, it can run Tiger just fine, but it's a bit sluggish. With all of these upgrades, it runs Tiger like a dream. When I switched to the Mac back in 2007, Tiger was the first operating system that I used. And ever since then, it's held an extremely special place in my heart. It's all about nostalgia. I think for a lot of us, a lot of this crazy old Mac stuff, nostalgia comes into it. Tiger and the Mac platform was the first place where I played a lot of these games. Max Payne, Quake 3, the original Harry Potter games. This is where I played them and it was super cool. So I now have a dedicated kitted out machine to play those games and get that nostalgia trip, which drives us to do a lot of this stuff. It certainly drives me anyway. So why Power Max? I get asked that all the time. I cover Power Max way more than I cover iMacs and iBooks and probably the more common machines that you'd see covered by collectors. 
For me, it's a combination thing. It's a combination of that really lovely collecting element that we were just talking about, the nostalgia and keeping the machines alive and all of that. It's a combination between that and my love for tinkering with machines. I am a computer geek. I love to tinker. A lot of collectors like to keep the machine in its original condition. I completely get that. But for me, I love being able to get in there and tweak things. The transformation that you can get by fiddling with a Power Mac is out of this world. And like I said, my favorite part, it still remains the same. It still remains the same machine. It's that same Power Mac. It's not some crazy gut ripping mod that changes everything and then suddenly you've got a new system. No, it's not like that. It's just about squeezing the platform and seeing how much you can get from that original platform, that original machine. How far can you push it? And that's what I love. Folks, this has been my little segment Ken, thank you so much for having me on the channel. It means the world to me that other people want to help me out, share my content, and just let me talk about this crazy stuff on camera. I've really enjoyed chatting about one of my favorite machines of all time, so thank you. Hello, Computer Clan viewers. My name is Michael MJD. I've been collecting Apple products since early 2010, which was actually around the same time that my YouTube channel was opened. So this computer has a very interesting story of kind of how that I actually obtained this computer, how that I actually came to own this machine. This computer actually came from, I believe it was an estate sale. I saw this machine at this estate sale and I was immediately uh, drawn to it. And one of the reasons why I was drawn to this machine is because I never had a Apple tower like this in my collection at the time. The only Macintosh desktop computers that I owned were the all-in-one uh, machines, so like the iMac and the Macintosh SE. And so I ended up uh, you know, inquiring about this machine to actually purchase it. And as it turned out, the person that actually owned this machine at that estate sale was actually a little bit of an Apple collector himself. He didn't just own this computer. He also had a few other Macs, about uh, three or four of them. And uh, when I learned that he was actually wanting to sell all of them and he sold them all to me for a very, very good price. Now in episode one, Ken was very surprised at the price that I paid for the iBook G3, as you may have seen from that video if you saw it. So all those other accessories. Hang on a second. A hundred dollars? Are you kidding me? I paid like 250 for this thing and it doesn't even have a freaking like first party charger. Like who were you talking to? Sorry. We'll get this, okay? So I walked away from this estate sale with not just the Power Macintosh G3 right here, but also a Quicksilver G4 and a Power Macintosh or a Power Mac G5 tower, all for around $60. Yeah, $60. I couldn't even believe it myself, but that's what he wanted for, you know, for all of these machines, and I really couldn't turn them down. So that was about like, what, $20 a piece? He, he didn't really want much for him. I was glad to, you know, take him off his hands. But that's how that I got this machine. And when I got it home, you know, I didn't really know like if it actually worked or not. And I thought that may be one of the reasons why that he sold them for so cheap. But they actually were fully intact and they worked 100%. I really only pull this out when, you know, somebody that I have over at my house asks about it and they think it's cool or uh, I'm doing videos for you guys here. One of the biggest things that I love about this computer is its design, and you have just access to everything. So that's definitely something that I uh, that I think Apple had in mind when they were designing this computer. It was sold with the Power Mac name, you know, intending that it was for professionals. So they wanted to make it, you know, pretty easy for those people to upgrade and uh, service their computers when they needed to. But uh, that is pretty much it for me. That is, uh, you know, my experience with the Power Macintosh G3. And I'd like to thank you guys for watching my segment. Hello there, I'm Steve from Mac84. It's no secret that I have a long history with Apple computers. And now I always wanted one of these computers, but it wasn't until years after it was discontinued that I managed to get my hands on one or two or three. You see, when I was younger, my interest in graphic arts and technology was evolving, and I wanted a big desktop computer of my own. It was still out of my price range, even for a used one. So I ended up settling on its cousin, the older and bigger beige G3 mini tower. And I purchased that from Macaballtrades.com for about 300 US dollars back in the early 2000s. 
And that G3 mini tower worked out really great, and it actually met all of my needs. I was able to expand it with a Firewire PCI card, and I had, at one point I even got an Apple PC compatibility card, and I ran Windows on there and some old games and stuff like that. Now, although they look very, very different, these two G3 models actually have quite a lot in common. They share the same PowerPC 750 G3 series processor, but of course the newer blue and white G3 model was technically superior in practically every way. It was even easier to upgrade with the easy to open side door. So although the mini tower had a door too, for any serious work inside of that computer, you had to unplug everything, put it on its side, and then the whole thing like sort of hinged. But the blue and white was much easier than that. This model also had faster processor clock speeds, a faster system bus, faster memory, and a faster PCI card slot made especially for the graphics card. I will admit, even though I did have the G3 mini tower and there was nothing actually wrong with it, I still was kind of jealous and I, I wanted one of these machines and it was probably just because of the cool case, even though, you know, just looking at the specs, it was basically a speed bump. Luckily, years later, I would find a G3 blue and white model of my own and, you know, I actually got several of them, but the first one I recall getting was from the Trenton Computer Festival in New Jersey. Back in the day, you know, these were PC shows. The Apple stuff was very limited and, you know, the stuff that was there, people really didn't want. And I mean, I wish I could just jump back in time and get some of those items. I mean, look at this Quadra 840 AV for $5. So now that I had a G3 blue and white model, I really didn't have a place for it since I was still using the G3 mini tower. But, you know, I just put it on the shelf and one day I thought I would use it. So here it is set up now. This is a 400 megahertz model. Um, it has a ETI Rage 128 turbo graphics card, uh, 256 megabytes of memory. And so this thing was set on its shelf for a while, just collecting dust until I picked up its beautiful matching Blueberry LCD display. The other function that this Mac serves in my collection is acting as a file server bridge. So this connects older Macs to newer Macs in my network. So it does that via this G4 Mac Mini that I have set up as well. So I'll take a, a file that I download from the internet on my modern Mac, and I will move that file to my Mac Mini. And then this G3 will connect to that Mac Mini, get that file, and put on itself. The G3 can then connect to older Macs, or older Macs can then connect to that G3. And so since they're all running a version of the classic Mac OS, everything's just more compatible and sharing things is actually very simple. Now I'm sure this setup could be improved a little bit and you know, it might even make more sense to have a G3 mini tower, the beige one, uh, in its place because that has some legacy IO and a floppy drive. But um, you know, everything's set up here on this desk now and it looks so beautiful. This machine even today just looks very modern sitting on this desk. So I think that's the way I'm gonna keep it. Hello, I'm Greg Rutke Oven, also known as Rutke Mods. I'd like to specially thank Ken for allowing me to be in today's video. It means a lot to me, Ken, and thank you very much. Anyway, I run a YouTube channel called Rutke Mods, which specializes mostly in Macs, but uh, I, it, it's a very multi-tech channel. I just mainly focus on Macs. And one of those Macs that have had many different videos on it so far has been my G3 blue and white tower right here. I now have two and a half of them. And what do I mean by two and a half? I do have a pre-production model I just recently got. This came out before Steve Jobs unveiled this January 5th, 1999. This has a production code of December 20th, 1998 on it. So this is one of the early ones. This one currently is gutted and it is going to be a uh, sawtooth modded system. It will have a sawtooth G4 board in it and uh, I'll be doing videos on that on my channel very soon and I'm really excited to do that. But the main system we will be talking about is my G3 blue and white right here. This was the top of the line model and um, it's not a G3 anymore. It's actually a Yikes G4. Uh, with an ADB port, and we'll quickly cover that in my segment. There is one thing that the um, first revisions have that the second revisions don't. If we notice here, it's just one IDE to 
the hard drive. Uh, the revision too is you could have two hard drives on one IDE channel. The re revision one you couldn't because of this chip right here, as we can see here. On the revision two board, which I have right here, it has that chip um, right here, and you'll see right here 402. That's how you can tell this is a revision two. And the reason why revision two is more important is because the IDE controller actually worked on these. The Revision 1 had a lot of IDE controller issues and if you were running OS 10 on one of these systems it could corrupt the drive a lot and um, they basically recommended to stay in classic and not run OS 10 on these systems unless you were using an external um, SCSI card like this one right here. We'll show you quickly the insides of my system here. This system actually started out as the top of the line 450 megahertz and I didn't even know what I was getting when I bought it. Uh, and Let's open it up here. Top of the line 450 megahertz. It came with a SCSI drive in it which is still hooked up and running great and it also came with a uh, IDE drive which didn't come from the factory with that but uh, I found one um, that was uh, factory correct for it and then the one under it is from probably an eMac from about 2004 and then right here we have the Yikes G4 and you have to flash the revision 2's to run Yikes G4 which I have a video on but it's very easy and um, also another neat trick about these boards here is you can overclock these chips by literally removing this jumper block right here like that and changing the jumpers around on it. You can use SCSI jumpers even to uh, change the clock speed on it and then you just clip it back down and you have a faster CPU. Here is my usual setup for my blue and white right here. Uh, the original keyboard a later um, Apple Pro mouse, some eBay special uh, USB powered speakers, um, but it's all nice and aesthetically pleasing to me. As we can see it is running a 400 megahertz power PC G4. This thing can run Leopard and it runs it quite well. Now Leopard will also not work with the uh, SCSI card that's in it. Uh, but it will work with the native IDE controller and stuff. They're really fun systems to play with and it's definitely one of my top three or four favorite Macs ever. And uh, I am very glad to be able to share it with you guys. And once again, Ken, thank you very much for letting me show you guys just how cool this thing is. And back to you, Ken. So there you have it. The 1999 Power Macintosh G3 Blue and White. It was a pivotal piece of Apple's new product strategy, and it pushed a lot of new features into the market. And it helped change digital video editing forever. And really, that's just scratching the surface. And if you have this G3, I'd like to know your own story behind it, or any other cool Apple product you have. And if you have suggestions for any other Apple products you want to see on the show, feel free to drop me a line down below. That's all I have for you today, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the not-too-distant future.